YouTube team keep it clean what's going on it's Engraven here with another video and another episode of NFL questions from subscribers featuring my boys from trust the bank this is the second installment of them being on questions from subscribers and what that is is a series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to based off of any NFL team and we answer it in a video just like this if you want to be part of NFL questions from subscribers then you can send me an email to team keep it clean at gmail.com or for the patrons you can send it to me directly on Patreon. And shout out to all the Team Keep It Clean patrons. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. And Team Keep It Clean as a whole, thank you very, very much. Because as we always do, y'all send in some fire questions in this episode. And Trust the Bank were friendly enough to join me on it to answer them. So let's go ahead and get into this it. This question came from my boy, uh, Justin C. He said, um, what are your rankings for the AFC North now post-draft. So who do you feel are the top teams in the AFC North uh, from one to four based off of roster alone post-draft? Now me, um, I'll start this one off. Number one, I go Browns. I go Browns uh, as far as just roster, just straight roster, nothing else but roster. Roster, I go Browns because they already had a super talented roster um, they have the quarterback. They got the the two running backs of Kareem Hunt and Chubb. They still have that all upgraded offensive line that they put a lot of work in last year. Um, and they also have the two tight ends. Well, actually, three tight ends because they got the dude from uh, who went to Florida. Um, because they got Austin Hooper, who I do think is a little overrated, but he's still he, he's all right. Um, but they got David Njoku, uh, and I forget the uh, the other tight end's name. But then they have the two receivers. Um, they got Odell. And uh, Jarvis Landry and Jarvis Landry, he's nice, man. He's nice. He was almost a Raven, but Ozzy couldn't uh, get that deal done. Um, and then they have their they have their version of Hollywood too. They got Hollywood Higgins over there as well, um, and they got some other guys too. But I, they have just so much talent like everywhere. And they went, they did a lot of shopping this off season, especially on defense because that was their weak point. Went out and got Jadavian Clowney. Um, they still had Miles Garrett, obviously. Um, they went out and got Troy Hill. They got Josh Johnson at safety. Um, they're getting Denzel Ward back. He was banged up last year. Greedy Williams, he missed a lot of last year. Uh, Grand Delpit missed the entire last year. So they're getting a lot of guys. They went out and got a lot of guys, but they're getting a lot of guys back who were hurt last year, too. Um, so they made a lot of moves to a roster that was already pretty stacked. So I would put them at number one. Number two, I will go with the Ravens. Um, number three, uh, I will go with Pittsburgh just because of the uh, the veteran presence that they have there. Bengals got some nice talent, but they're, they're very, very young and inexperienced. Um, so I will go Bengals at number four. What about y'all? Mine's very different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my number one, I'm going with the Ravens. Okay. Um, I think last year, last year was such, I don't think we talk enough about how weird their season was last year. Like the whole middle of the season was completely thrown off, um, but I feel like they're they're obviously a very good team. I I think number two is Pittsburgh. Um, I think people are are ready to write off Pittsburgh because we don't like Pittsburgh, um, and we're we're like, all right, they're done because you know last year they struggled down the stretch. Um, however, I think people really underrate the loss of of Devin White, their linebacker. Um, mm -hmm. When they lost him, that defense, I think it was week eight or week nine, and they, they started 11-0, their defense crumbled. It was still good, but it was it was like – it was borderline all-time great, like, you know, maybe a top-10 defense all-time uh, through those first, you know, weeks with Devin White, with uh, – obviously they don't have Bud Dupree anymore, uh, but I think their defense is going to get back to being a stud defense. But then I think – they're finally going to have a run game. Um, James Conner is a good running back. I don't think he's the most talented ever, but they drafted Najee Harris, who is, who in my opinion is an absolute stud. Um, and, you know, he could be a, a better running back than Le'Veon Bell was um, for that. I don't think he will be, you know, in his rookie year or anything like that, but he's a very talented guy and big Ben will be allowed to, you know, not have to throw it every play uh, because that's what they had to do. <laughs> <laughs> and his old arm was not able to do it. Um, but then the Browns, I love the Browns. Uh, 
oh, don't take that out of the context, but <laughs> I'm a big fan of what the Browns are doing. I'm a huge yeah. Baker Mayfield fan. Um, I, I think John Johnson, who they signed at safety, is one of the most underrated safeties in the league. The Clowney signing was good. Like they made a lot of moves. I had them making the playoffs last year. I think they'll do it again. Um, I think there will be three uh, North teams in the playoffs again. But for me, Pittsburgh just has that like, for me, I trust that defense of Pittsburgh a little bit more, and I think we're all trying to write off Pittsburgh a bit too early. Um, I think they they got one more year in them um, of of really competing at maybe not for a Super Bowl, but for competing for the North um, this year. Oh yeah, okay. Um, if we go on top of wild, just you know, football football perspective, I gotta go over Cleveland first. Baker, Chubb. Kareem Hunt, Najoku, you know, Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham, Greedy, Denzel Ward. I mean, damn, when Denzel Ward was on the field, uh, ain't nobody, ain't nobody, nobody was getting past him. It just, you know, when you call off those names, it's like, well, you know, these guys looking good over here, you know, they possibly can make something. And plus, let's think about it, y'all. We had, we, uh, they played one of the best games against us last year. You know, with with uh, Lamar coming back in in a saving the day, mm-hmm. um, so you know, I definitely, I definitely go with, uh, Cleveland first. I would say the Ravens second for the simple fact that you know, um, we don't have the big names like we used to, but we have guys that can come in and come in and play. And you know, the Ravens' way is plug and play personnel. You know, understand understand the scheme of things and get the job done. You know, so we got a lot of guys that you know. If you would have thought they was work, that you you would have thought they worked construction the way that, the way that our guys play. You know, come in with your hard hat, lunch pail, go and get the job done. That third spot, I'm gonna have to give it to Pittsburgh for the simple fact. You know, like like McConnell said, you know that defense. You know, when you have a Devin Bush and a Minka Fitzpatrick, when they made the trade for Minka, then it was it was just a a a lift, a boost. It almost reminds you of the Troy Palomalu days. And James Harrison almost and Lamar Woodley. And you know, you remember they still got uh the younger Watt brother. Yes, they lose Bud Dupree, but still, you know, they got a they got a veteran presence in Joe Hayden. So you still find and the Steelers still find ways to win. And also mm-hmm. you have the better wide receiver from Notre Dame there too, in a Chase Claypool. Um and you you know, you get your you get your TikTok sensation back. In Juju, uh, Deontay uh, Johnson, and one of the most underrated wide receivers in that uh, group. But you know, he shows so many flashes of how he can be a elite um, player on that team. And then, you know, yeah, you got drunk and uh, you got drunk Wild Bill and Ben Roethlisberger. Um, I feel like it's I feel like his time is up. You know, neither here or there. But you got a saving grace in Najee Harris. Now, is Najee Harris going to be the next coming? Um, the next coming of running backs? Most definitely. He's a workhorse. And being in that uh, being in that grand scheme of play at uh, Pittsburgh, he's definitely going to get a lot of touches on the ball, whether it's running or passing. I just don't hope I just hope they don't overwork him and mm-hmm. you know he misses out because he is he definitely is a great talent. And um, you know, the fourth the fourth is uh, Cincinnati, of course. They're a growing team. You got Joe Barrow. Now you got Jamar Chase. But still, you know, Cincinnati, I'm not even going to say they're on the cusp. They got a lot of work to do. So, um, and a lot of growing as a team. So, you know, that's, I'll go with that for the AFC North. The next question came from my guy, Justin C. Uh, he said, What do you think about us having five of our six divisional games in the last part of the season? Do you feel like we would have more of a late hot streak like last year, an early streak with late adversity, or a hot streak throughout? Uh, this season's layout makes both uh, halves very different, uh, but both so vital. With only one buy for playoffs and an extra game, mm, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Ooh, I, it all just depends on what kind of Ravens team we're going to get. Uh, we, um, we, we, we've seen the changes that they made. We've seen the additions that they made. We've seen... Uh, the personnel that they brought in, uh, we've seen the different, the new coaches that they brought in. Um, so it's very hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. But with the schedule, it's like 
I mean, football schedules, I know they always have the different rankings, like, oh, this is the first hardest schedule, this is the second hardest schedule, and so on and so forth. But football just is it's hard. It's, it's very hard. It's tough. Um, like you were saying earlier, uh, it's 90% mental and 10% physical. And with the, the schedule, with what it is, uh, you, you face straight out the gate. It's going to be tough. Like you are going to be your very first game of the season. Your very first regular season game is in an away stadium. The fans are going to be back for the very first time. So, you know, and it's Raiders fans. Mm -hmm. Granted, they in Las Vegas now, so it might not, but it's still brand new stadium. It's going to be so much hype surrounding it. And the, the beginning of the season, that's what everybody feels. And everybody does technically have a chance. So there's going to be so much energy there. And you're going to feel that energy now. It's going to be a lot of Ravens fans out there too, but it's just going to be so loud. It's going to be a crazy atmosphere. Um, so from the jump, from the very beginning of the season, you can't slack off. And you have to be consistent. And now, like you talked about, there's even that extra game in there too. So that makes it that much harder uh, for everybody. So whatever, it, I, I, it's kind of too early for me to really say what the Ravens are going to, I mean, we don't know what the Ravens are going to do. I don't even know what to expect from the Ravens as far as are they going to get on a hot streak early on or a hot streak later on, or are they just going to ride the season out and just be hot all season? That's the goal, and hopefully they will. But I, I just don't know because I don't know what type of team these Ravens are going to be. Um, I don't know how the coaches are going to perform. I don't know how things are going to be executed. Um, but I just – I do think, though, well, however however it goes, however hot they are at whatever given time, I do think that they're going to do what they need to do in order to uh, make it to the playoffs. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. That's the most important thing, whether they win a division, whether it's a wild card, whatever it may be. Um, I think they will definitely do enough to make it in the playoffs. Uh, and then from there, that's that's where the real questions start. Y'all can go ahead and take it away. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a real quick answer, and it, it, it depends on Greg Roman. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, it, if Greg Roman – obviously, if Greg Roman is, is really good and, boom, performs all the way through the season, like, boom, that's set. Uh, but if he doesn't perform and he gets fired, maybe it's like mm. week five, maybe it, it's – if he gets fired after week four, then we go into, I believe, Monday Night Football against the Colts, uh, one of the best defenses in the NFL last year, and all of a sudden there's going to be some interim guy. Maybe it's Keith Williams or something like that. Like, well, we, It'll be very interesting to see um, how it all works, especially with the offensive coordinator job. Now, I, I, I'm a believer in Greg Roman. I think he can do his job. But um, if he does end up like getting fired or something like that or even after the bye, like, this whole season could get thrown, you know, there could be a wrench in this season and mm -hmm. we would be, you know, it could put us in a, in a bad spot. So I don't know. It just depends on Greg Roman um, as pretty much every big Ravens game has come down to, but um, <laughs> you know, Greg Roman, that's it. <laughs> oh man. Um, I definitely thought like this could be a toss up for the simple fact that, you know, um, yes, the Ravens did play in some stadiums where it was some fans, but you're talking about, you know, going back to five, possibly a packed house. Now, we all know, you know, when you go back to playing against, you know, a full stadium, that's the 12th, that's the 12th man on the field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, Ravens, I, I, I really don't worry about Ravens playing away. I mean, we seen what we did. We, we seen what we did in, you know, Seattle. You know, we showed out against uh, the Los Angeles Rams, things of that nature. So I know we have the capability of um, winning away games. It's just, you know, everybody's coming back from the pandemic. You don't know if they're – I'm pretty sure they're going to still be taking COVID tests, stuff like that. And um, hopefully we don't have no Dez Bryant situations. I'm, that, that, that very that, – that frustrated me very bad. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't understand that, but neither here or there. So, I mean, it's so many factors to play, you know, to factor in this year. It definitely go one of two ways. Um, I'm – I'm just looking at the first three games, man. I can see us going possibly two on one, and just making a run. That that those last five games of the season, I'm, it, it, I, I don't say I don't see it breaking us. If anything, I see it make us. I see those last five games, you know, definitely giving us a push. I mean, granted, the Steelers going to play the Steelers are going to play tough. Uh, those you know week thirteen and week eighteen, but you know you got the Bengals. Um, you got the Rams again. You know you got Green Bay. You don't know what quarterback you're going to 
you don't, y'all don't know what quarterback y'all going to play against in Green Bay. Right. And, you know, week 14, Sunday, one, was that Cleveland? I mean, it's going to be good games, but it all about, it's all about, you know, like Engraven said, like, and even McConnor. Um, I'm definitely, I'm definitely rooting that we fire Greg Roman and uh, move, uh, That's good. move my guys up. But, you know, it's definitely like Engraven said in, in, in his um, initial statement, it all depends what Ravens show up. Now, you know, I remember for the I remember for the Ravens to do poorly in the first half and just run, you know, all steam rolling in the second half. That way they can take that momentum into the playoffs and possibly we can run that take that momentum all the way into the Super Bowl. So, you know, it's all it really depends. So the next question came from my guy Devin not Duvernay. He said, hey, Engraven, hope you're having a blessed day, man. Got another question for you. This involving our wide receiver room now. I feel like because we have four tight ends on the roster right now, well, actually, we got, like, we got more than four because we got Mark Andrews, oh, six. Nick Boyle, Josh Nick Boyle. Oliver. Um, We just drafted Ben, ben Mason, he like fullback slash tight end. Eli or Noah Wolf, I always forget his first name. Jacob Breeland. And Tom, Eric and Thomason. Thomason. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we got like seven, and are there more? I think they just signed. Uh, a fr- if Luke in- Wilson is still here, I don't remember if he is. No, um, they they cut him once he dropped okay, that good. pass in that Steelers yeah. game. They cut him the next week. But <laughs> okay, they, good. They did. <laughs> they did sign an undrafted free agent guy. Um, Ben Vol, not Vol. What's his name? I forgot his name. But yeah, so we got more than four. Uh, but anyway, he said, and we're a run first team, so we don't need so many. Because of this, we will most likely have to cut one before the start of the season. As of now, at wide receiver, we have Hollywood, Watkins, Boykin, Bateman, Wallace, Prochet, Duvernay, Deion Kane. And he said, I believe I got them all. Well, nope. Benjamin Victor, too. That's another one. They just signed uh, Dante. Oh, I, I cannot say his last man. name. You know how to say his last name? <laughs> I think it's like Silencio would be my guess, but yeah, it, I know it's French. I don't speak French, so mm. that's my best yeah. shot. I, yeah, I, I ain't even going to try, but we, we got a lot of receivers. Um, and he said, obviously, Watkins and Hollywood clearly stay in the new additions from the draft and Rashad Bateman and Tylen Wallace. Agreed. Uh, this means the rest can be cut. Who do you believe we cut? Uh, personally, I hope we keep Duvernay the most. Do you think we cut any of these guys? Interested to hear your thoughts on this and hope to hear from you. Much love and keep it clean. Oof. Um, uh, this is, I think it's between, I think Duvernay is good. I think Duvernay is safe. I don't think anything will happen to Duvernay. Um, I, I think it's between Boykin and Prochet. And I, I honestly think that uh, Prochet right now has the toughest chance of making the team. Um, with Miles Boykin, uh, since he is known as being the best blocking wide receiver on the team, uh, I think that definitely helps his chances a lot uh, and with, with his draft status as well. I know it doesn't make him necessarily safe, but I think his draft status, him being a third-round pick versus Prochet being a fifth-round pick, but then at the same time, you could look at it like, man, Miles has been here since, what, 2019. Prochet has only been here in a uh, the, the COVID year which was last year, so he didn't even have a, a regular offseason. Um, so his chances were limited as far as development and whatnot, and, and then even up with opportunity on the field. Um, but I still think Boykin has a, a slight edge over him. Um, so I and, and with Deion Kane and Benjamin Victor um, and Dante, they, they have a uh, – th- their chances are, are very, very slim, especially with them being uh, – they weren't drafted by the Ravens. They weren't like signed as like official free agents. They were signed a future reserve deal. So um, they that will most likely be like practice squad candidates maybe. Um, but as far as active roster, uh, yeah, I think it's between Boykin and Prochet, and I think Boykin has a uh, a leg up on him. What about you? Yeah, uh, I I wish it was Prochet. I really wish Prochet would make the team. I'm a big fan of him. But yeah, Boykin being the the blocking. T- I almost said tight end that he is. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no, but him being the block and wide receiver, that um, thing that they got for him uh, is something that the Ravens have shown. They've shown that they really want to use Boykin. It hasn't worked. Like, 
ever except for the Seattle Seahawks game uh, when they took that shot. Um, I know he he caught a deep ball from like RG3 in one game. I don't remember what blowout it was. Um, But like other than that, like he hasn't had a ton of success on the field. uh, But like they keep going to him. They keep bringing him back. Um, and, and it feels like they're keep, they really see something in them. And I saw something on Twitter the other day and it was, you know, him in, in college making a one-handed catch yeah, and then like stiff arming a dude and running yeah. through another guy. And I was like, man, where did this guy go? <laughs> um, but you know, well, I think, it, I think T Martin and Keith Williams will be the guys that decide it. Um, mm. And I think that they'll see the potential. They'll see the potential that, I mean, Duvernay was a third round pick and he was a third round pick for a reason. He has that potential and they're going to see that over the potential of uh, James Prochet. And I think that's why they'll keep him is because, you know, with new guys, they'll be able to come in and be like, all right, if they see that potential, they're going to try and unlock it uh, to the best of their ability. And I think Boykin has that potential and I think they'll recognize it and keep him. But I love Prochet. I wish, I, I wish somehow he'd make the team, but I don't know how it'll happen. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to have to be that dark horse. I see us letting go of our flex tight end and Miles Boykin. I'm saying it right here, saying it right now. Um, <laughs> I feel mm. like um, actually in training cap and priest and you know if we do do preseason games, I feel like that will be um, James Prochet's actual audition. You know you, he got drafted in the COVID season, didn't really have a chance to showcase his work. I mean he only hit the field maybe twice, and um, you know he only caught he maybe caught a ball for 14 yards. They tried to put him on special teams. He never did special teams. The only person that really showed that they could actually get themselves on the field and thrive on special teams was Devin Duvernay. You know, that's that's a dog. You know, he, he's, he's a baller. Um, oh, hold on, hold on real quick. You, you Proche had like, never you know, done special teams in college? Nope. No. Not from what, not from what I know. Well, I ain't know that. Hey, that, that, well, so, that's no, important to know. I appreciate that. Go ahead, man. You no, know, he took that opportunity just to get on the field. And we all, we all understand that, you know, some things you're going to do sometimes when you get to that next level, you're going to do some things so you can, you know, get that play time. So I'm pretty sure, you know, John Harbaugh being the special teams guru that he that he is, you know, mm-hmm. hey, James, how you feel about doing uh, special teams? And I'm pretty sure James Poche, you know, being a rookie, you're like, you know, coach, I'll give it a try, you know. <laughs> and it didn't, it didn't really work out for him. So, you know, I feel like, you know, with a whole full, a full uh, mini camp and hopefully preseason games, I definitely feel like, you know, um, James Poche will, sh- uh, will show out and work out. Uh, that Miles Bokin's train for me has is gone in sale. Yes, he's 6'3", 6'4". Yes, he can run maybe about a 4'4", 4'5". But his his play is so inconsistent. And me and McConnell actually talked about it previously on one of our shows. You know, you Miles Boykins, he, he seems like he alienated himself from the rest of the receiver, rest of the, the receiving group. I mean, if we look at it, he wasn't out there in Arizona, you know, with Lamar Jackson and the rest of the group. Um, when you see in certain games, if there are plays designed to go to Miles, you know, it's like he's just out there trying to figure it out. Like he's, you know, confused. Sometimes he's in the right place, and sometimes he just, you know, out there with, you know, like a deer. <laughs> and I just, I'm just ready for. I'm I'm in go mode. I'm I'm for guys stepping up, you know, making making plays consistently, balling out, and helping uh, put our team in the best situation possible. And right now, I don't feel like our flex tight end is capable of doing that. Now, if you surprise me this year, I'll eat my words. But right now, you know, I'm on the train of James Prochet. Next question came from my boy Martin M. He said, I know Ravens just signed Alejandro Villanueva, but could you see the Ravens also signing Rick Wagner for depth? if he comes at an affordable cost. At the tackle position like EDC, one moment you think you're strong in this area, but it can quickly become a weakness when someone gets hurt. Um, that That's a really good point, uh, but I just, I don't see them investing uh, any more like significant money uh, into the tackle position, uh, especially after what they signed Alejandro Villanueva for. I know it's a two-year, $14 million deal, but it's really kind of like a one-year, $8 million deal since it's only $8 million that's guaranteed. Um, but I just, yeah, I don't I don't see them investing any serious money uh, into, a, into a backup tackle. If it, if it was super cheap, nah, not even. Maybe like for training camp or something just to see, depending on how the other guys are looking and whatnot. But I just, nah, I, I don't see them signing Rick Wagner right now. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's going to retire. I think that's why he was cut was because he was contemplating retirement. So, I I mean, I just you know maybe if Joe Flacco was here or something like that, and he's like, all right, I'll go back to my guy, but he's not. So uh, maybe maybe he'll sign with where's Flacco? Maybe he'll sign with the Eagles or something like that. Um, but I I think he's going to retire. So I yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I definitely feel like we are uh, not going to bring in Rick, Rack, uh, Rick Wagner, somebody that actually um, saw us possibly bring it in, but I didn't see them uh, making any conversation with is James Hurst. Just off the strength that he was a Ravens before, um, he, he he's one of those, you know, tough guys, get the job done. And, you know, he's one of those um, schematic guys you can just plug in and let him play because um, if we looked at last year, they did a lot of that, you know, with DJ yeah. Luka and Tyree Flitters. And, you know, I just hope a smart defensive coordinator don't realize what we're doing and figure that out and, you know, dissect one of our plays. And next question came from my guy, Mac P. He said, do you think Rashad Bateman uh, must have a Justin Jefferson type of impact for the Ravens to have a successful season? Uh, the Vikings are also a run-heavy team with Dalvin Cook, but Jefferson's impact didn't go unnoticed in his rookie season. What are your thoughts? Hope everything is good and wish you and your family the best. He said, hashtag road to a million subs one day. Uh, but do I think Rashad Bateman has to have a Justin Jefferson-type impact for the Ravens to have success, a successful season? No, not at all. Um, the, the, the Vikings are a run-heavy team, but the Ravens are like a run-heavy, heavy, heavy team. Like, they... The way that they run and how much they run, it outweighs every NFL team by far. It's not even close. Um, so Rashad Bateman, his impact, I think, is going to be on some of those third and longs uh, where he may have a defender draped all over him. And Lamar just got to build up that big trust for him and be able to throw it to him and he can make the contested catch. I, I don't think um, I don't think his rookie season is going to be comparable to a Justin Jefferson. I, I think those are great expectations, but I don't think they're realistic expectations. Uh, Justin Jefferson, he just, man, not to say Rashad, Rashad Bateman is nice. I like what he did in college and stuff, but this offense that he's in, like, like I said, they all run heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, but so for him to have a – for the Ravens to have a successful season, uh, he just got to be ready. When his number is called on, he has to be ready. And and for it to be considered a successful season, um, not that he won't have any drops. Because he's going to have some drops. Every receiver is going to have some drops. Um, but the drops have to be extremely limited. Um, and the like I said, the contested catches, that would be my biggest thing, and that would be the way I think he makes his biggest impact. I don't think it's going to be on the level of Justin Jefferson – but I think it will be a, a, a still a significant impact. What about y'all? I think in a sense, he does have to have a Justin Jefferson like season, but it won't be statistically uh, like there's no way he's going to be like, you know, oh, wow, look, 1300 yards, 13. T-. Like that's not going to happen. Right. Um, no, I, you could put uh, Julio Jones. You could put DeAndre Hopkins, Devontae Adams, whoever you want to say is the best wide receiver in the NFL, put him on the Ravens. They're like, like, Maybe they put up 1,100 yards. Like maybe. Um, like they're not gonna they're not gonna put up crazy crazy receiving numbers. But what Rashad Bateman could come in and do and is bring something to the Ravens that they haven't had uh, with Lamar Jackson at quarterback, which is defensive coordinators afraid of the pass um, because they come out they play against the Ravens and they go. Eight guys in the box yeah. at all times. Um, you can be a secondary player, you can be a linebacker, whatever. Get in the box, uh, stop the run. But if Rashad Bateman is able to come in, and all of a sudden, you know, obviously we got Sammy Watkins. I think he's going to help a lot in that aspect as well. But if Rashad Bateman helps elevate that a little bit, not only will it help himself, but it'll help Hollywood Brown because they won't be able to have that safety over top, okay. um, which will help that passing game. Just it'll just like compound. It's like a snowball effect. Bateman being good will allow Hollywood to be better, which will allow defenses to focus on the pass, which will help the run game, uh, which will help uh, Sammy Watkins, Mark Andrews, Lamar. It'll help everybody. Um, so if he's able to come in and run those those slick routes that we saw him running in college, I think it'll be Justin Jefferson-esque in that it'll completely transcend the offense. It just won't be numbers-wise, um, like, at all. Like, you know, a, a good season, I'd consider it like – I'd be like, wow, that's a really good season if he puts up, like, 800 yards and six touchdowns. I'd be like, oh, yeah, nice. He balled out. But uh, people – like you know, the national media will look at that and be like, bust. 
but you know, that's <laughs> the Ravens aren't going to throw the ball a lot. So unfortunately, right. Well, but kind of, um, you know, your boy did say it's going, it's going to be a different type of offense this year. So who knows? Um, do I feel like he needs to have yeah. a Justin Jefferson uh, season? No, I do not. For the simple fact, we're in the AFC North. Uh, AFC North right. is all about hard no smash mouth football. And for, you know, the Ravens, they've been doing that so far as the run. As the, run. the thing that we need for Justin Jefferson is mm, – excuse me. I guess I wish I had him on the team. Sorry. Um, the, <laughs> <laughs> I, would like I just realized you said that to <laughs> to solidify himself as a number one wide receiver, which I feel like you know in those first couple of games he'll put people on notice with his smooth route running, being able to catch uh catch the ball and, and the yards at the catch. I feel like he's going um he's he's going to hurt a lot of cornerbacks. You know he's he's definitely going to show you know what he's capable of, and I feel like you know once they start respecting Rashad Bateman. Like McConnell said, man, that's gonna open up that's gonna open up the wheelhouse for everybody. You know, mm. it's gonna take all of those, you know, eight, ten men in the box, they're gonna say, Well, well, dang, hold on now. When the Ravens gonna pass the game like this? When they get re- wide receivers on the outside that's actually gonna catch the ball and take it up the field, you know. We gotta respect that. Here we here, here comes Lamar Jackson, JK, and Gus. You know, you know how that goes. I mean, that's that that could be a all, all day formula. So we're not looking for wide receivers to go for 1,500 yards, 15 right. touchdowns. We're looking for that balance, you know, solid run game, but also a complimentary, complimentary passing game. And I feel like, you know, those first, those first couple of weeks, they say, well, dang, this rookie, this rookie can play. Let's, uh, defensive coordinator is going to say, well, you know, let's start respecting. Let's start, let's start, let's start respecting what the Ravens are going to do. Because I feel like, actually, week two is going to be the game with Sean Bateman and the wide receiver company really shows what they can do. But we'll see. I'm just, you know. <laughs> the last question on this episode of Questions from Subscribers came from my boy, uh, Jonathan S. He said, Yo, Raven, this is Jay Shaw, Raven fan from Mississippi. Been a fan of it for a few years, and I just started watching right before the 2018 season, ironically, right after Lamar Jackson was drafted. Although I've been a fan of the Ravens ever since Ray Lewis was on the cover of Madden, LOL, uh, Lamar gave me new life with the squad, and I think 2021 is about to put it all into perspective. I'm pretty sure the Chiefs are going to be our biggest test heading into the regular season. Uh, My question to you is, do you think Giro will overcompensate for the fact that Orlando Brown Jr. knows too much of his offense. I mean, why trade him to the Chiefs anyway? It is what it is. I just want to know your thoughts. And P.S., I got tickets to this game, and this will be my first time in B-more. The first home game of the season against the Chiefs, I can't wait. Well, you picked a good game to go to. Uh, my last question, oh, what are mm-hmm. some of the must things, what are some of the must things to do or, or see in B-more? Appreciate it and best wishes for you and the fam and your continued success. All right, so for the first question, um, I, I mean, no, nah, I, I don't think Giro will necessarily overcompensate since Orlando Brown Jr. is on the Chiefs because uh, players switch teams every year. They go to different teams every year, uh, and they go to a new team that plays their previous team from the pre- previous year every year. It, it, it happens. It's not a big deal. So and of course they the players give each other they'll they'll give their coaches tips or whatever why wouldn't they but it's up to I, I feel like even with G Rose playbook I feel, I feel like <laughs> I feel like we as fans like we we even know what's coming half the time we, when we're watching at home like a lot of stuff it won't even surprise us so with the Chiefs I, it, it it'll be fine I, that's not that I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, but as far as some of the, if this is your first time going to be more, um, some of the must things, must things to do or see, um, especially if you're going as a Ravens fan a- after the game, um, well, that's a Sunday night game. So it's going to be kind of late. Uh, but I-, I would go to Jimmy's man. I would go to Jimmy's because it, it'd be better on if it was a one o'clock game because I know a lot of the players they go there after uh they go there after the games and stuff. Um, I would go to Jimmy's. I would go to uh to Pappas. Well, that's a little outside though. But I mean, you can go to the aquarium if you want to see the fish and all that. You can go to the harbor. Um, what else? <laughs> I mean that like 
just really going to the game like that that's the that's the biggest thing just being because it's one thing to watch it on tv like that's one thing but actually being there in the stadium it's like nothing like that man especially when you get to be in the stadium of your own team that you rock with and that you rooting for and you get to be around like 50,000 people that's all cheering for the same, well, 77,000 people in Raven Stadium, but you get to be around all them people that's cheering for the same team you cheering for as well. It, it It's crazy, man. Um, So that, that like right there should be enough. Um, But yeah, you, you, you just got to go get some seafood and you'll be straight. Once again, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping high hopes that, you know, it's going to be a different type of playbook. The playbook's going to be open up. I, I don't feel like, uh I don't feel like G Rose going to be like, oh, well, you know, yeah, we got Orlando Brown. We, we we playing against Orlando Brown week two. We got to make this great scheme of plays. No, um, Ravens fans, remember, they only have him for one year, and I don't think they're gonna have that much money to give him an extension. Don't know how how the money's gonna look for Kansas City. Not really worried about it. But you know, McConnell said it more than one time. You know, we got we got double we got the double O agent, Mister Away, uh, one of the fastest defensive ends. Do I feel like he's gonna give Orlando Brown Jr. a run for his money? I, I sure, I sure enough do feel like he's gonna uh, come out there. Uh, that untapped potential is gonna show out, and he's gonna he gonna make he gonna make uh, them regret, you know, this trade. So, you know, I feel I feel that way about that. Um, some dope things to do in Baltimore, especially around the Ra- especially around the Ravens game. You gotta go to horse. You gotta go to the Horseshoe Casino. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of entertainment. Um, you can get on the stage, sing music. You can sing, do karaoke. You know, whatever have you. Um, when you go inside, a, when you go to the casino, as far as eatery places, if you if you like to eat, if you like to uh, eat, they got one of the best pizza spots inside there. Uh, when they go to crab, when it comes to the crabs, man, um, you gotta go. For, you gotta go further out. Not too many places downtown Baltimore to get crabs, but definitely Jimmy Seafood. Over there in the Dundalk area, I definitely would say. And if if you don't even make it to the game, like inside the stadium, you can always go to like the green any green turtle. There's always great vibes in there. You know they got good drinks and definitely good food. So you know just being around downtown Baltimore, mm-hmm. right with the Ravens playing, and especially it being one of these um, highlight games, you know you're gonna find you're gonna find some things to do. I mean, it, it'd be some people that you never that you never met in the day of your life, but you show that you got a Ravens jersey on, they'll take care of you for the night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah they show a lot of love, man. Yeah, we look out for our fellow Ravens fans here, man, for sure. I mean, in terms of things to do in Baltimore, no, no clue, <laughs> never been. Uh, but uh, in terms of Orlando Brown Jr., um, we see guys switch teams all the time. I mean, how much information did Chris Wormley give the Pittsburgh Steelers? I, I don't think he gave them too much. I don't think that was something that they were like, oh, we got so much intel. How much intel did we get from Mike Wallace? It, not a lot. Like, I don't think it's something that, you know, And even like Eric Weddle, I remember he came and we played the charge and he was like, for me, I don't give out that information. I I don't tell um, my new team uh, about my old team because, you know, it, you know, kind of like a, you know, you signed an NDA. Uh, You didn't sign an NDA. I I don't think they signed an NDA. Uh, But, um, you know, overall, I think it's just one of those things where they kind of know what's going on. Like they, a coach can watch the film and be like, oh, yeah, in this play, you know, the right tackle or the left tackle is going to, you know, clear out to the left side or something like that. And Orlando Brown Jr. can tell them that, but they're going to change the keywords and the phrases and things like that. So, like, Orlando Brown Jr. is not really going to know. Like, maybe you'll have, like, a slight insight. Like, there's a chance they do this, but in Griffin, like you said, I mean, we Ravens fans know what they're doing. So. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that the other coaches know. Um, so, uh, like Clay Matthews told uh, Cam Newton, it's a it's a run, and Cam Newton said, "Well, you've been watching film uh, through that quick wheel route." So, mm-hmm. uh, Ravens got to maybe use that to their advantage and see, like, hey, um, you know, only in certain situations. You don't want to overdo it and like change your entire offense and you know do all that stuff. But I, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference in that aspect. Of it.